Get your free copy of the complete tutorial at www.teachucomp.com forward slash free. The relational model of data storage used by Access allows us to more easily and effectively model a complex concept like sales. The relational model of data storage eliminates redundant data entry and also creates less data to store making our relational database smaller and faster than the large flat file databases that you may be used to using. When you create a relational database you will first need to perform some data modeling. Data modeling allows us to ensure that when we are recording all of the necessary information that we're putting it into the appropriate tables and making sure that we identify the appropriate entities involved in the relationship and their relationships to each other. Now when you create a relational database, you try to identify the unique entities involved in the process. These entities will often become the various tables in your database. So for example, if we take the sales database, the flat file we were working on from the last lesson, in this database the customer is an entity. Within each table that we create for each entity, we must only list fields or columns of information which share a one-to-one -one relationship with the entity or subject of that table. So for example, in our customer table, we would want to place the information first name, assuming that each customer only has a single first name to record. We would not want to place information like items into the customer table as the relationship between the customer and the items purchased is one to many. So what would we do with the column of item? In the relational model, each field or column of information is an attribute of an entity. So for what entity is item an attribute? In other words, with what entity does the item, a description of the item purchased, have a one-to-one -one relationship? Perhaps you may initially think that the item is an attribute of the sale. However, you could have a single sale with multiple items ordered. So in that case, it must be an attribute of something else. In this case, item is probably going to be an attribute of an item entity, meaning that we'll probably have an item table with the item name being a field or a description of that entity. So many times when initially approaching data modeling, it may be easier to list the various attributes that you wish to record and then try to find what entities the attributes describe. The entities that you find become the various tables in your database. The attributes become columns within the entity tables. Remember that each attribute or column in your table must share a one-to-one -one relationship with the subject of the table or the entity. In either case, you should probably keep your information written down on paper until you have a rough idea of what information you want to record about what entities for the process or system which you're trying to model. It is a rare feat to have your preliminary sketch of the relational database tables turn out to be the model that you'll actually create and access. Many times you'll need to create a model, look for problems with the model that you've created, and then edit this design until you're ready to begin attempting creating the tables and access. So let's look at a preliminary model of the sales concept that we were trying to create here. First, let's make a listing of the various pieces of information that we want to record. These become the attributes of the various entities. So for example, we might try and say, well, attribute first name is an reference to the customer entity and so it belongs to customers. Last name is also an attribute of customers. Company, address, city and state along with zip are all information that has a one-to-one -one relationship with our customers. Now the sale date when they bought something that's not an actual attribute of a customer. A customer might make many purchases. So maybe we would say that that's an attribute of a sale. Maybe the items would be an attribute of the items themselves. Quantity we might think is part of a sale and amount. 
So you initially go through and you try to attribute all the attributes to the entities. Next, we would then make some sketches of the tables with the fields of information within them. And this can help us start to visualize what tables we will need to create, and it will also allow us to begin to see how the tables will eventually be related to each other in a larger relational database structure. Once we have a rough idea of what we would like to record and what tables we will need to record the desired information, we must then ensure that each table has what is called a primary key. A primary key is a column or combination of columns that will produce a unique value for each row in the table. For example, if you had two different people named Mary Smith in your database, you would want to be able to differentiate between them. Many times an additional column is added to the tables in order to provide this unique identification. Perhaps you could assign each record a unique number in some sort of an ID column. That is what your social security number is used for by the government. You also have a unique driver's license number as well. If you were recording any of these pieces of information, you could use those as the primary key of the table. If, however, you aren't recording any type of unique information, then often you must assign your own unique values. Many companies, for example, assign employee ID numbers in order to uniquely identify each employee, even if they have the same name. So let's look at how our data model will change once we assign primary keys to our table. Let's say that we want to uniquely identify each customer. Currently, we aren't storing any kind of information that would enable us to uniquely identify each record or row in the customer's table. So let's add an additional field or column of information to this table and call it Customer ID. Let's also create another column for Sales ID in the Sales table and an Item ID in the Item table. So, our data model after inserting primary key fields, which you can see in bold and italics within each of the table diagrams, would look something like this. Now, the primary key is a very important concept in a relational database because it is through the primary key assignment that we can then create the necessary relationships between the data tables. For example, let's take the relationship between the customers table and the sales table. Speaking in terms of one-to-one -one and one-to-many, for each one customer, there can potentially be many sales. So the two tables share a one-to-many relationship. This is the most common type of relationship between tables with extremely few exceptions. What we need to do next is find a way to join the many side of this relationship to the one side of this relationship. We need to show how each entry in the sales table is related to the customer in the customers table. In order to join tables, however, they must have a shared or common field between them. This would be a field that contains the same data in both tables. So in this example, we are trying to assign each sale to a customer. To do this, we will want to add a field to the sales table that corresponds to a field in the customers table. Which field would we choose? The answer is the primary key field. Remember that each primary key field is designed to uniquely identify each record in the table. So we can then add a field to the sales table that will make a reference to the values in the customer ID field of the customers table. That way, when we enter a sales record in the future, we will only have to enter the customer ID number of the customer to whom the sale was made, reducing redundant data entry. So we begin to see one advantage of the relational model in that we only have to enter the customer's information once for each customer, assigning them a unique customer ID. When we enter the sales for that customer into the sales table, we will only need to make a reference to the appropriate customer ID for that sales record to indicate who made the purchase. This will require us to store far less redundant data in our tables, actually making them smaller and faster to use than the flat file model. 
It's also important to note that the customer ID field, which we will add to the sales table, is not a primary key. That table already has a primary key field in the sales ID field, which uniquely identifies each sale, like a receipt number. Technically, we call the field in the many table, which makes a reference back to the primary key in the one table, a foreign key. Its only purpose is to relate the two tables, and the values within a foreign key are almost always non-unique. Don't worry about the mechanics of the data entry, or how we create primary keys and joins just yet. We'll explain how to do that in the later lessons. So for now, just try to comprehend the concepts and reasoning behind the relational database design. So let's take a look at our table diagram and reflect the change between the customers and the sales after adding our foreign key and joining the two fields. Let's now turn to examining the other relationships in the table. For example, what is the relationship between customers and items? Don't be fooled. Not every table in the database has to be directly related to every other table. The only way that customers and items are related is that the customer purchases the items in a sale. The customers and items do not have a direct connection. However, in a relational database, as long as every table is connected in an appropriate manner to the correct table, you can find out how they're related to each other through the tables by which they're connected. So in summary, the customers are connected to the items, but only through the sales. So how are the sales and the items connected? Well, for each sale, there may be many items ordered. Also, each item may appear in more than one sale. In relational database design, you cannot, or should not, create a many-to-many -many relationship. That would make no sense from a strictly logical point of view. We need to be able to tell which items were ordered on which order while reducing the amount of data entry. Also, we may notice another problem with our current layout. The amount field is attached to the sales table. How can we record the price of an item at the time of sale? What if the price changes in the future? Is the amount an attribute of the item? What we're starting to see is that we need to be able to link the unique sales records to the unique items ordered on that sale. We need a sales details table to do this. But what we do place in the sales details table is anything that's an aspect of the many side of a sales transaction. So for example, the sale date field can stay in the sales table, as each sale only occurs at one point in time. The quantity of the items purchased at the time of sale is actually part of the many aspect of the sale and should be moved to the new sales details table along with the amount field. The customer ID will stay in the sales table as each sale is made to a single customer. So let's add a new table for sales details modeling the new entity and look at how it should affect our table diagram. So shown is the diagram of our new tables in the relational model of sales. We must also remember that the new table of sales details will also need to have a primary key. But before we turn to assigning the primary key, let's look at how we will relate the sales table to the sales details table. The tables are related in that each sale may have one or more items purchased. So we want to join each record in the sales details to the sale record to which it corresponds. To do this, we will need to add a foreign key into the sales detail table that corresponds to the values in the primary key in the sales table. So we will add the sales ID field to the sales details table. In the same vein, What's the relationship between the items table and the sales details table? Well, for each item ordered in a transaction in the sales details table, it must make a reference in the items table to a unique item. Thus, we will also want to add the foreign key of item ID to the sales details table. 
Then we can join the tables through their shared or common fields. Let's examine how the data table diagrams may look after performing these two tasks. Now we have all the necessary relationships between the tables created. However, we're still missing a primary key field for the sales details table. We could simply add another field for the primary key, such as sales detail ID. However, we could also see if there's a combination of fields that may produce a unique value. In fact, there is. The combination of sales ID plus item ID. There should never be a repeating value in those two columns. If there were, it would mean that the same item was ordered on the same order twice. If that were the case, we should have only listed it once and instead placed a 2 into the quantity field. So assuming that we make this the primary key, let's examine our data diagram at that point. This is our final data diagram based on the information that we decided we wanted to record for our sales. Obviously, there's more information we could record, but this example is simply supposed to illustrate some of the decisions that go into table design before you should even begin to create the tables in Access. So once you have a rough idea of your table design by making table sketches, at that point you would want to begin to create the tables in Access, enter some data, figure out if it works or how well it works, and note some of the issues that you may want to change before going too far into your database design. Like what you see? Pick up your free copy of the complete tutorial at www.teachucomp.com forward slash free.